So Melody Ryan is our next speaker, and Dr. Ryan received her PharmD and Master's of Public Health degrees from the University of Kentucky. She completed a pharmacy practice residency at Duke University and a neurosciences fellowship at the University of Kentucky. She has appointments as professor in the College of Pharmacy, Division of Pharmacy Practice and Science, and at the College of Medicine, Department of Neurology at the University of Kentucky. Her practice site is a neurology clinic at the VA Medical Center in Lexington. She earned her certification in geriatric pharmacy in November 1998, and she attended board certified pharmacotherapy, or attained, I'm sorry, board certified pharmacotherapy specialist status in 2000. She currently serves as the immediate past president for the Academy of Pharmaceutical Research and Science of the American Pharmacists Association. And she has also served, as, similar to our first speaker, as, the, uh, as a speaker here at the Updates in Therapeutics Pharmacotherapy Prep Review Course since 2003. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ryan. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. And just for the record, I did attend the course twice before I got up the nerve to actually do it. All right. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Let's buckle up. I have nothing to disclose, and we're going to go on a whirlwind tour of neurology. So let's start with our first case. TM is an 18-year-old new patient in the pharmacy where you work. He presents a prescription for carbamazepine, 100 milligrams, BID, with instructions to increase to 200, one POTID. Currently, he doesn't take any medications and does not have any drug allergies. During your counseling session, he tells you he has to have blood drawn for a test in three weeks. So which common potential adverse effect of carbamazepine is best assessed through a blood draw? Is it leukopenia, renal failure, congestive heart failure, or hypercalcemia? Okay, I'm seeing all blue, and that is correct, leukopenia. So if we look at carbamazepine adverse effects, some common ones are rash, which can be serious, including Stevens-Johnson syndrome, um, SIADH, aplastic anemia, thrombocytopenia, anemia, and leukopenia, so a lot of blood dyscrasias. Okay, so one month later, same person comes back with a new prescription for Lamotrigine, 25 milligrams, with instructions to take one tablet daily for two weeks, then one twice a day for two weeks, then two tablets, BID for two weeks, then three tablets, BID after that. He says he's discontinuing the carbamazepine because he developed a rash a few days ago. So, which is true? The rash is likely caused by carbamazepine because the rash often has a delayed development. The rash is unlikely to be caused by carbamazepine because carbamazepine rash usually presents after the first dose. The rash is probably not caused by carbamazepine. It's probably attributable to carbamazepine-induced liver failure. Or it's probably not carbamazepine. It's probably carbamazepine-induced renal failure. Okay, seeing a lot of blue again, and that again is correct. The rash is probably due to the carbamazepine because often those rashes are delayed anywhere from two to eight weeks after starting the drug. So just because it's not after the second, third dose doesn't mean it's not the medicine. Um, most rashes for antiepileptics can include just a simple rash, can include Stevens-Johnson syndrome, can include anticonvulsant hypersensitivity syndrome. So a lot of serious things. In the case of carbamazepine, the recommendation for testing um, is, is now available for some genomics testing for HLA B star 1502 allele in patients who are of Asian ancestry, including South Asia. And those patients um, have a tenfold increased risk of rash if they carry that allele. There's another allele that um, currently there's no recommendation for testing, but is sometimes being tested for, and that's HLA A star 3101. And usually those patients are Caucasian, also increased risk for rash, but it's not as well quantified, and there's no recommendation at this time for, for testing in everyone. Okay, so same patient wants to know why it's necessary to increase the dose of Lamotrigine so slowly. And you say, it causes dose-related psychomotor slowing. It causes dose-related renal stones, dose-related paresthesias, or dose-related rash. All right, 
right, good. It does cause dust-related rash. So the rash with lamotrigine is a little bit unusual because it is related to the starting dose of the medication and to some extent how fast you go up on the drug. So that's why we have a really slow titration schedule. And you want to be especially careful in pediatric patients that you're getting the right dose. And there's even a five milligram tablet to use so that you can get the appropriate dose for those kids. Um, it's also the reason it takes a million years to get up on the dose when you're on valproic acid. Okay, so the, the titration schedule there starts one every other day. So it's very, very slow. So um, you want to pay a special attention if you've got somebody who's also taking valproic acid. And the rash can be anything from fairly mild to quite serious in nature. Uh, it does have a black box warning, and we do recommend stopping the, the medicine if the patient does get a rash. So it's really important to titrate slowly so that you don't lose the use of a medicine that might be potentially useful for a patient. Okay, now we're gonna switch patients. JG is a 34-year-old who has been maintained on carbamazepine extended release, 400 milligrams twice a day for the past two years. She's had no seizures for the past four years, but today she has status epilepticus. So what do we wanna do first, diazepam? Lorazepam, phenytoin, or phenobarbital? All right, I'm seeing more of a mix here. The right answer here is lorazepam. So let's talk about why that is. So a couple of principles for status epilepticus. We always want to give an emergent medicine to stop seizures immediately. So in this case, that means a benzodiazepine. So right there, we know it's either going to be lorazepam or diazepam, right? And then we want to follow up with an urgent medicine to prevent recurrence of seizures. Our urgent medicines usually are things like phenytoin, phosphenytoin, phenobarbital, valproic acid, now levetiracetam, sometimes you see. Um, generally, all of our medicines that we use for status, we want to give something that works quickly, so we usually use parenteral medicines, unless there's some really extenuating circumstance. And lastly, remember, we aren't using a neuromuscular blocker, except in the case where we need to intubate a patient or for some other reason. But just stopping the muscular effects of the seizure doesn't stop the activity in the brain. So using a neuromuscular blocker is never the right answer for status epilepticus. But why not diazepam? Well, for